that context. And I'm saying this is serendipitous because it's really serendipitous for me. So Ron Goby's highly invasive species in the Great Lakes of Canada and the U.S. I mentioned Great Lakes. They're a major problem. When I got hired at Windsor, I built my first entered discovery grant before I got there. And I was getting a look at sound production in a marine goby that had been a classical model goby. I got a very excited new professor. I got my grant, went to Florida. I couldn't find any stinging gobies. The sites I had with my friends mapped out they, for reasons that are still a mystery. All those classic gobies I want to look at in the marine systems, they, we know they produce sound, they, they do many displays, they've been worked out for years. They're gone. I was swimming in raw sewage since you look at these damn things. Brand new faculty member, I got the big grant. Now, <coughs> luckily, I knew the round nobody had just gotten established. No one knew anything about it. They called, they didn't hear anything. I was able to get a round goby call from a colleague in Wisconsin, John Jansen. So it's serendipitous for me because I'm an acoustic biologist, got hired. <laughs> the invasive species make sounds and respond well to them. The other thing they are good for for ecological context is they got very clear reproductive role. This is a reproductive male round goby. The reproductive males turn black, they guard nests, <coughs> they make calls on the nests, females come to the nest and spawn. So it's a perfect system for me to have a reproductive male sitting there doing nothing but calling, and probably with some pheromones as well, so some other folks in Windsor are looking at that. And the females respond to them but with a nice phonotastic response. I breathe a big sigh of relief, and it happened with all the of research. They may have an alternative reproductive tactic. It's still up for debate. We don't have good paternity evidence yet, but there's another male morph that doesn't guard a nest, doesn't turn this big black color. But we think, or some people think, they do come in and sneak fertilization. We don't have good evidence <coughs> for it yet. As a true sneaker male, which is why I'm sort of weaseling my way around it, but they probably are males that are mature. They're going as they look a bit different. But don't guard a nest. And near as we can tell, don't call. So it's a nice to look at how do they use sound in a reproductive context, what signaling information might be there in a freely responding system that I have literally thousands and thousands of individuals I can grab from the uh, from minutes from my field in my lab. And so a set of students, uh, Jeff Lee and Megan, who just graduated, have been looking at essentially how hearing is used in this reproductive context. I'm going to tell you a quick story about physiological plasticity, the Jeff stuff, but then also behavioral plasticity, and if we can use this to figure out what do these fish calls mean. We know fish make sounds, we don't know a lot about how they're using them, what it might mean, and how it might differ between different morphs, between different genders to really drive these responses. Looking at Jeff's work with physiology, <coughs> we first found, we give with this brainstem response approach, that there is a gender difference in reproductive animals. Reproductive males here, and this is again, this is actually particle motion threshold, because they don't have a swim bladder, they don't do pressure detection. Again, up here is worse hearing, down there is better hearing. Females, the, the filled circles, essentially hear better than males, physiologically. They have better thresholds. If you play actually a piece of the call itself, they respond better. They respond better to certain tones. <coughs> and the, the C's and D's are frequency significance. That's gender differences. But there are gender specific differences. Females hear better than males, and it's males that are making the calls to attract females. Jeff wanted to know more detail what's driving those differences. And so with Oliver Love at Windsor, a really first rate endocrinologist, he looked at estradiol levels, and what we did this time is measured here again as threshold. We want to see the degree of response in the brain to a super threshold stimulus. We measured actually the amplitude of the brain response itself at a given sensation level, <coughs> and we get in the same health of the threshold as estradiol increased in the blood of the females, their pulse amplitude increased. So it seemed some evidence for hormonal relation between brain responses and reproductive status in the females themselves. And Joseph's nails work in Washington on uh, midshipmen shows that they have actually upregulate estrogen receptors in the brain, sorry, in their ear and the brain, with 
reproduction between infants driving, partly driving these responses. If there is a hormonal effect, as they get more mature, they're also upregulating um, neural firing patterns. And they're also actually upregulating the total number of density of hair cells in the ear itself, so each of these little dots. In the hair cell, this is actually utricle for building. Between males and females in reproductive status, females have more hair cells. So as they're maturing reproductively, there is a difference in hair cell density as well as neural firing in the brain itself. So there is a reproductive correlate to the sound detection. And it may fluctuate with the maturity of the females. We didn't follow any through until they were no longer reproductive. But then we wanted to look at behavior, it doesn't really matter. Okay, fine, the brain uses fire in the hell. Does the fish actually care? Can we use this as a system to see what the fish are responding to? So Lisa, my master's student, is looking at different morphs of fish and with the tongue and sneaker male and quotes that they probably are across the X. So now we've got these reflective females and reflective males. Looking at the two different calls. The males will make a call on the nest to attract the female in. And we also make an aggressive call to other males, and we've seen males chase other males away just with this aggressive call. And we're seeing that with Lisa's work, reproductive females spend more time than the other groups at this reproductive call. They're highly attracted to it. They go to the speaker and they stay at that speaker for longer. But if you play an aggressive call, they have nothing to do with it. They actually don't even approach the speaker for the aggressive call. So there's, re there's differences in behavioral responses between the reproductive females and the other morphs, and they really don't like aggression. We don't know why this is going on here. Sneaker males seem to respond to aggressive calls. We can wave our hand and make them just sort of stories, but we're still trying to figure out why they respond. Now, you do get differential response to different kinds of calls. And so Megan, and my student just graduated, wanted to look at this more carefully and see what kind of information those females might be getting from each of those males. How much variation is there in male calls? Is it a goby call or goby call? Do females not care as long as the right species? These are some other stuff that they respond, they don't respond very well to other goby species. So she wanted to look at essentially honest signaling, is there a potential for getting information about individuals <coughs> just from their calls? Her graphs get complicated, so I, I made a cartoon simplification. <coughs> she did a print components looking at body morph characters and call characters. And essentially what it, the way it broke down is the interpulse interval, the spacing between pulses in a call, and the frequency of that call does give information about variation within a male. So that large, essentially fat-headed <coughs> heavy males have lower frequencies, which we've seen in other species, size varied in the inverse frequency and a longer interpulse interval than the skinnier, smaller headed males. I think they're probably making sounds with the head region, we're still debating about how they make it. But as the head gets fatter and wider, and if males are heavier, you get frequency changes and pulse duration, or pulse interval changes. So then, okay, you, do, you can map variability of male characters just with the calls. Do the females care? We can now use the species to actually ask the females directly. And so what she did is had a bunch of behavioral trials presented <coughs> in two choice paradigms, different calls from different males. And again, big juicy reproductive males make low frequency calls with long IPIs, and female preferentially respond to those calls. Especially with interpulse interval, oops, typo. More females respond to those speakers playing long IPI, oops, sorry, there it goes, and lower frequency calls, so males that were big and fat and happy, if you play their calls from a speaker, you attract more females. So we're arguing that there's variation in male calls, and these females may be using the, just the call itself to get information on maybe fitness, in quotes, they haven't measured fitness correlates, but size at least of males which other people have found bigger males do have more edge in the nest. And what we think is going on, we do know that then the signals will vary with the reproductive state of the male. The females will vary their response to their reproductive state, and they may be getting male size. And what we think is happening in the field 
These fish live relatively colonially. You get large aggregations of nests in prime locations. All of them are on the nest. We think what's going on is that sort of male chorus, <coughs> again, apologies to the bird people without a true chorus, has a lot of sound emitting from those nest areas. The females may be attracted to those areas from some distance, again, probably in a proper commotion range still. And then they may be choosing which male to go to, partially based on acoustic signals, so that bigger males sound different, bigger males might have different nests, and they can use sound at least partially to make those final decisions. There's also a heavy pheromone component to it. These males are releasing a large number of pheromones, a large volume of pheromones that find the nest to get the pheromones out. And so with others at Windsor, Walensky especially, we're looking at how those two cues interact. Or we think probably they are using the acoustic part to approach that area and may have enough information to choose a higher quality male from other smaller males. <coughs> And overall, the sort of overall message I think I'm putting together in my head for the acoustic part of my work is when fish are communicating, they actually are probably using both the ear and the lateral line. And the gobies too, we've done some experiments, knocked out their neural masks, their hearing does change in similar ways. I have to quit thinking of sound detection in fish as a hearing response, as a feel, and it's more integrated response. But that response may be you know, on a signal. And I think the fish acoustic world is a bit behind in terms of thinking about how fish are using sounds, what it really means to the sounds. <coughs> Honesty and signaling has specific values with it, but also specific meaning. We haven't shown a fitness correlate to it yet, but at least they can get information on condition just from variation in sounds. Others working in Europe, and then Joe's working in Washington, is finding similar things. But there may be enough variation in male response in male calls in fishes, like in other vertebrates, or other inverts as well, to really help drive that uh, selective decision. And then finally, the last one I'm going to show you is just my little soapbox I've been saying for the last couple of years at meetings. We haven't really taken an evolutionary perspective to this stuff. We've got lots of good physiologists working on goldfish, not some other species. We have lots of good people working in the field looking at individual species responses, but we're just now trying to get into an evolutionary perspective on what it all means. If you look at a simple father and distribution of fishes, high frequency hearing, and again the, the argument has been high frequency hearing evolved to detect signal from background to, to get rid of the low frequency background. There's not a lot of good evidence for it. If you look at an evolutionary perspective, high frequency hearing has evolved at least four separate times, as near as we can tell. So these circles are where for sure you'll have high frequency hearing evolving. And each of those, may be probably more than one, <coughs> in this cluster here, you have many different mechanisms for how it's evolving. So four is a conservative estimate. I think it's actually quite higher than that. And in many families, or sorry, many orders, and even within many families, you get some species that have high frequency hearing in various ways, some that have only low frequency, only pressure, only particle motion detection. I think we need to take a more systematic approach. We, we've been playing this a little bit with some of the perk uh, components, especially the scientists, trying to figure out how many times has this really evolved. And then also, can we map expected character, habitat characters on this to see has it really evolved in high noise environments? Has it evolved in what should be shallower waters? We don't know yet. The auditory skin analysis stuff is still sort of hand wavy. It makes intuitive sense. We haven't really taken, we now just trying to take. Uh, systematic approach, or others, or fish call and others, I think it much better than I am. But it's something that we sort of lie behind in the field on this approach. And with that, again, a lot of the work we've done at Lee with Craig, but <coughs> Mark Gummery, who's one of my scientific heroes, is director of Lee Marine Lab, is very welcoming, and some of Craig's students. And then the good thing about Windsor, again, is I collaborate a lot with people like Oliver Love. And my students, of course, did all the work, as always. I yelled at them to do more work. But they figured all this stuff out. Now with that, I'll stop. And thank you for your attention.